you call the book burning questions and i just have to ask you this is there at this moment one question that burns above all the others yes but it's not in the book because it hadn't happened yet okay <laughs> just talk right. about so that. Uh, so but let me let me put it in a more general way i think the the question is what kind of world do we want to live in and that can be viewed from several different angles what kind of an ecological world do we want to live in do we want to continue to live on the planet that's a pretty big question but what kind of government do we want to live under so do we want to live in a liberal democracy if so hop to it because uh, this is the moment do we want to live in autocracy do we want to live in a tyranny do we want to live in an oligarchy do we want to live in a monarchy do we want to live in an anarcho-syndicalist uh, cooperative of some kind um what sort of government do we want to have so right now we have the um liberal democracies of the west aligned in a way that they haven't been for a lot of time um and facing uh, uh, an autocratic uh, system so that's pretty interesting but you and i judy have been there before we were there in world war ii and we also were there all through the cold war when we were told you know if the banana bomb goes off hide under your desk <laughs> remember that <laughs> Yes, yeah, duck and cover, duck and cover. Yeah, yeah. there's a skit on on um, Beyond the Fringe in which a, a British bureaucrat is saying to the radio audience, no, if the autumn bulb goes off, outer bulb goes off, you know, all you have to do is, is, is crawl into this government-issued large paper bag and hop <laughs> along to your nearest uh, rescue center and they will tell you what to do. So, you know, we lived through all of that. Remember but when? Like, we were, yeah, when, but you know, we were kids. I don't know about you. I mean, but, but we, were we were teenagers. We, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I don't know if we really understood. No, of course we didn't. Today we understand. A bit more. Okay. We think we do. A bit more. Yes, we do. Okay. So let's, let's, so nature science, Margaret a recurrent theme in your fiction and nonfiction. So I thought it was your parents' career, but maybe it was just your father's career and how um, that affected your childhood. I'm always interested in knowing what makes, uh, what makes someone grow up to be a writer. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it happens in childhood. We may even be born that way, but I'm pretty sure that there's something in your childhood. So tell us about that. Your childhood, your parents being scientists, tell us. Mm -hmm. um, so my dad was a forest entomologist and how he got that way is a story in itself because he was from the very backity, backity, back, back, rural backwoods of Nova Scotia. Um, one room schoolhouse, no high school. He took his high school by correspondence course uh, all of that. And um, my sister just found a manuscript that he wrote when he was quite old, detailing that journey, you know, how he got there. And it started with a large green caterpillar in childhood. <laughs> Anyways, here we have the father being a, a forest entomologist dealing with infestations, you know, things that kill a lot of trees. And to do that, he had a research station up in the north woods of Quebec. So I was carried into the north woods of Quebec in a pack sack when I was uh, six months old. And I would spend um, spring, summer, and fall in that location. No electricity, no running water, no schools, no libraries, no town, no village. Uh, there were a few houses that we could see accessible by water and a path, uh, but no roads to that. And what did that mean? It meant no television, of course, there wasn't any anyway, um, no theater, 
not much radio that you could actually get, but there were books, Judy. So I was an early reader, but you were too. Uh, and I was an early writer because that's what there was to do when it rained.